Hey guys, uh, very excited, very happy to have uh, Glenn Greenwald here with me today. Glenn, what's going on, man? How you doing? Not too much. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm doing pretty good. So um, we, uh, I guess you could say, kind of met because uh, somebody sent you my uh, my ceasefire video, right? My new atheist yeah. first progressive ceasefire video. And uh, I had tweeted something to you about a speech you gave, and I think it was 2011 or 2013 on civil liberties and... It was great, man. I mean, basically, your argument, I, I couldn't order it any better. You were talking about how, uh, you know, it's, it's non-negotiable. The whole point of the Constitution, the whole point of civil liberties is that, no, these are concrete, and the government can't just take it away whenever they feel like it. So uh, it tw I tweeted at you, and then you responded and said, you know, you'd be uh, willing to have a conversation about my ceasefire video. And so here we are, man, and I have to say... Here we are. I'm really, really excited to talk to you because I've been following your work for a long time, and uh, we'll get into it later. I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> be uh, too much of a, a fan here, but you know, you've done some stuff that is going to go down in history. Is it, it'll be right there in the history books alongside Daniel Ellsberg, alongside you and Snowden. I mean, it's some big stuff. Thanks. That's nice of you to say. So, uh, floor is yours, man. You tell me uh, where you think I went right, where you think I went wrong in the uh, the New Atheist vs. Progressive ceasefire video. And then later on, you know, we can get into, if we have some time left, we'll get into, like, NSA and all that other stuff. Right. Hopefully we will have some time yeah. for, for other matters. Um, yeah, you know, it was interesting just because uh, this has become such a, a kind of acrimonious um, and intractable uh, debate between two competing factions um, that takes place largely over the, the, the venue of Twitter, which I think is part of what inflames it and makes it very difficult to make any progress about it. Right. Um, and so to, somebody sent me this, I think, because they were as surprised as I was that there was somebody who was saying, you know what, I actually think that um, both camps have some valid points and some really terrible points. Um, and, and so I thought it was a really valiant and probably fruitless effort um, <laughs> to, to reconcile uh, these two camps. I mean, I do think it's funny. Um, I remember in law school um, when we first started studying the law of, of defamation and like First Amendment law, it's pretty common where um, two groups that seemingly have things in common um, end up fighting with one another far more than they do with, with you know, groups that would, would be more obvious adversaries. Um, and so much defamation law in New York that you study as a first year law student arise arises out of um, these wars, these really vicious protracted wars that like these tiny little communist groups would have with one, with one another, where, you know, like the leader of some eight person communist group accuses the other um, leader of like a nine person communist group of defaming him and it ends up in court for 10 years and they spend all their resources on it. And it's these tiny little groups with pretty much everything in common with tiny doctrinal differences and they end up warring with each other. Um, and that was, you know, one of the points that you made that I thought was interesting and wanted to address was this idea that I think you called it something like the 50% rule. Yeah, it's just my own goofy little thing where I say it's not even that you shouldn't argue with people who you agree with 50% of the time. It's just that if you acknowledge that at least on 50% we agree, yada, yada, that, that sets a tone for the conversation on both sides where I think everybody's more likely to go, oh, okay, let me hear you out because you're not a crazy person. Right, and, and you know... I think that's a nice principle, um, and it's one that I just sort of, you know, referenced or even appealed to a little bit myself in describing what I just talked about, but I think it's actually, in general, um, it, it can be a pretty misguided principle, and I don't think it's actually applicable to, to the, the conflict that has arisen between, you know, for want of better terms, sort of new atheists and progressives, many of whom, ironically, are often themselves actually atheists. Um, so... I, you know, and, and I, I just want to make this point, which is, you know, it's, this is not a point about new atheists or in any way trying to imply anything about them. It's really a, a way of testing the logical validity of this principle or of this idea, this 50% idea, which is, you know, you can imagine, for example, somebody who says, you know what, um, I agree with you on so many issues. Like, I think your views on tax policy are fantastic. Um, I agree with you on gay marriage. Um, I think your feminism perspective is really great. Um, we have a, a huge amount in common. In fact, I agree with you on way more issues than I disagree with you on. There's this one thing. Um, I personally believe uh, that the white race is superior and that laws ought to reflect that, um, and you don't believe that. Then you could say, well, look, don't be so angry with this person. I mean, you guys agree on most issues. And I would say, no, you know what? Actually, a certain kind of 
disagreement can be so significant um, that you do end up regarding that person as an adversary, not an ally, notwithstanding the fact that you agree on lots of other different issues, especially when the disagreement um, is you know, found in the area where that person is exerting the greatest influence, or a certain idea can become sort of so pernicious that it outweighs agreement on other issues. Right. Um, and I think that is really the nub of what this dispute has become, which is that, um, you know, it's not a dispute about atheism, because as I said, I think um, a huge percentage, um, if not the majority of people who are, are speaking out most vocally about new atheists are themselves atheists or certainly not religionists. Um, I think it's an argument about what is the impact of being in the West, in the middle of the war on terror that's now in its 15th year, in societies where Muslims are largely minorities who are overwhelmingly disliked, of spending the vast majority of your time talking about how their defining attribute, which is Islam, is not just a bad idea, but the worst idea. Um, and I think the problem has become that, you know, the view of the critics of new atheists um, is that regardless of intention, um, that that has become a really toxic and destructive way of talking about the world um, if you're somebody who's a citizen of the West in this particular context. Um, hold on one second. I have a... Take care of that. No problem. Yes, yeah, she needs to be yeah. taken care of. So I'll, I'll sing show tunes for the audience. No big deal. All right, good one. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so that's the first point. The second point I wanted to make is... Um, you know, there's this interesting attempt by, by new atheists to sort of belittle and minimize and trivialize their own presence in the public discourse. Like they like to say, you know what, we don't actually stand for anything at all. We just have unbelief. We're just about non-belief. Um, so we don't really even have an agenda. Like we don't have a system of beliefs um, or a worldview or a mentality. And I think that really actually does um, do a disservice to the impact that they have had in terms of their own arguments. And obviously there are a lot of different people who identify as atheists or even new atheists who have different views on a whole variety of issues. Um, but I do think if you look at the person who tends to be the most inflammatory trigger for these, these disputes, which is Sam Harris, um, he clearly has you know, a very clear and set out and developed worldview, not just on atheism, but on a whole variety of political questions, including foreign policy that are highly controversial. Um, and they tend to be views that are very much anathema to huge numbers of progressives. Um, so I don't think that this is about, you know, tiny little trivial dogmatic doctrinal disputes like the communist example that I began with. I think it's a pretty fundamental debate um, about some pretty weighty issues. So uh, Okay. Yeah, let me, let me just yeah, and yeah, let go me ahead. think that that worldview is, um, you know, I, I wrote about New Atheists for the first time, I think in 2013, um, and I wrote a really long piece with The Guardian that continues to kind of be the, the, the thing I would point to that best encapsulates my view of all these debates. And there was this quote from Sam Harris that to me kind of illustrates the crux of the disagreement. Um, he said, look, liberals think Dick Cheney is a really bad person who did a lot of really bad things. And that's fine. You can think that. But what liberals need to understand in order for them to be rational is that there are tens of millions of Muslims in the world who are, quote, far scarier than Dick Cheney. Um, and, you know, that worldview is very familiar and it's very common. It's essentially saying, yes, the United States maybe does some bad things in the world, um, but they don't really rise to the level of evil. If you want to know true evil, look to the adversaries of the United States, which is not just Al Qaeda, not just ISIS, but tens of millions of human beings who identify as Muslims. Um, and, you know, in the recent exchange that Sam Harris had with Dick Cheney, with uh, Noam Chomsky, um, you know, he identified uh, the United States as what he called a well-intentioned giant. Um, and he said very much the same thing about Israel before, that like, yes, the United States and Israel might do some bad things, um, but we're morally superior to the adversaries of the United States and Israel. And so when I look at Sam Harris, what I see is a person who is an American, who's a Westerner, who's a self-identified Jew, 
who runs around making the argument that the United States and Israel are morally superior to its adversaries. Um, and, you know, to me, this is just kind of pure primitive tribalism. It's sort of like the nub of what has driven the war on terror for the last 15 years. The idea that, sure, we do some bad acts, but when we do it, it's by accident. We do it because we're really well intentioned. The true evil is them. Um, and I think the reason that it's gotten so much attention, negative attention, is because unlike, say, Bill Kristol or Dick Cheney or like actual, you know, hardcore neocons who you can look at and know exactly what they are and what they think, um, the way in which this particular set of beliefs is lending support to this agenda is much more subtle and insidious and kind of disguised. Um, and I think, therefore, is more pernicious, more deserving of attention. Um, but whatever else is true, I think there are very serious, radical, fundamental differences in worldviews that this debate has largely been about. Right. Uh, and then if I could, just the last point I want to make um, is, and this is all sort of in response to your video, which I hope people will watch. Um, you know, first, because I think it lays the context really well. Yeah. Um, you know, as I said before, I do think a reason why these debates tend to be so acrimonious is because they are playing out largely on Twitter. And Twitter is pretty much the single worst invented format that human beings have ever invented for debates to take place. Um, you know, it's a totally new frontier. There are all, there, there's all kinds of like ambiguities about how you interpret even what people say on Twitter. If you link to someone's article, do you then become responsible for every sentence in the article? Um, is it fair to then attribute every sentence in that article to you because you've linked to it? If you retweet something, um, does it mean that you're doing it with approval? Are you doing it with ironic disapproval? Are you doing it just because you think it's interesting and you agree with some parts or others? All of these questions are, there's, there's no convention for how these um, Twitter statements are to be interpreted. And so when you have an adversary, you can interpret it in the least generous way possible um, and do nothing but inflame the fire. Um, and I think that combined with the fact that I do think Sam Harris tends to be much more of a kind of trigger for a lot of the acrimony than say even Richard Dawkins or other new atheist figures um, because he tends not to have the courage of his convictions and, and likes to say provocative things and then objects, how dare you be offended and provoked by the provocative thing I purposely said. I think a lot of this has created you know, a, a very kind of um, unconstructive way of having these debates. Um, so anyway, those are just sort of my general thoughts about your, like I said, noble attempt to reconcile some of the sides. So on to just focus here for a second on, on the Dick Cheney point, I think that um, what we're looking at there is basically the idea of empiricism versus theory. So you would say, and I would agree with you on this point, that Dick Cheney is empirically worse because if you tally up the body count and how many people Dick Cheney is responsible for killing, that number is significantly higher than anybody who we might say is a complete and utter enemy of the United States and even rightly say is, a, is an enemy of the United States. I think his point there, and again, I tend to agree more with your side on this because it's empirical. I think his point there, though, is if you were to give al-Baghdadi or Osama bin Laden when he was alive the same amount of power as Dick Cheney, that he would actually purposefully kill way more people. Do you agree with that or no? Not necessarily, no. Um, I mean, look, I think, of course, you can find people worse than Dick Cheney. And Osama bin Laden and al-Baghdadi might be, you know, two examples of people who are worse than Dick Cheney. Um, and had Sam Harris said, like, look, Dick Cheney is not actually the most evil person in U.S. history, you know, in world history. Adolf Hitler was worse. Mao was worse. Um, Stalin was worse, and Osama bin Laden is worse, um, I think that that would be a reasonable statement. And I probably wouldn't have much of a problem with it, nor would I think anybody else would. He didn't say that, though. He didn't say Osama bin Laden and al-Baghdadi are worse than Dick Cheney. He said there are tens of millions of Muslims who are worse. Um, and, you know, Dick Cheney, you know, actions didn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, they happened because of beliefs that he had uh, about, agree, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, about, you know, the use of violence. Imperialism. About, he's a, he's yeah, a and, through and through imperialist. 
Right, and about the you know superiority and inferiority of certain kinds of human beings, and about the relative value of human life, and um, the justification for the most heinous things human beings have ever done, like torture and in prison without charges. These are all beliefs that he had, and ways that he acted on those beliefs. And so, you know, like I said, I mean, I think I think this is what I think is is the core of the the issue for me at least, and I think for a lot of other people, which is. I think that one of the most odious and destructive human attributes in, in political life is tribalism. The idea that we look at the world through our own tribal prism, we see people in our tribe as inherently superior and people outside of our tribe as inherently inferior, that we think that our tribalistic subjectivity is actually rational objectivity because we're inculcated to view the world in certain ways that we automatically equate as being the correct ones. And what I see New Atheists doing, and this is more than anything the thing that I find objectionable about them is engaging in rank tribalism. You know, I am a I belong to this tribe. I belong I'm an American, I'm a westerner, I'm a Jew, I'm an evangelical Christian, and therefore I see Muslims and Islam um, as the greatest threat, and I'm going to devote my life to, or my intellectual life, to depicting it as the supreme evil. Um, whatever else that is, it's not intellectually innovative, it's not edgy or courageous, it's not an exercise in extreme rationalism, it's just pure tribalism. Right. Um, and that, to me, is what I see most when I see these new atheists, people who are sitting in the West, who are American, who are Jewish or evangelical Christians, who have all sorts of tribalistic incentives to view Muslims and Islam as the greatest threat, devoting their intellectual lives to making that argument. It's actually boring because it's so primitive, but it needs attention because it's also so destructive. So in terms of – this is the way that I like to phrase it. I understand exactly what you're getting at, but this is the way that I like to phrase it. I actually, I personally believe that liberal values are superior. The problem arises when you try to use illiberal values to implement liberal values, because then you're doing an ends justify the means type thing. So, for example, if we talk about Israel, you know, they, they'll often say, we're only democracy in the Middle East, and, you know, we stand for liberal values, and then you go, but wait a second, you're doing occupation, and, you know, you're militaristic, and you're aggressive against the Palestinians, and you can go down the list. And the problem there is that, that they're using illiberal values, and then they turn around and say, well, no, we stand for liberalism. Well, you do, except for when you don't. And those illiberal values, I, I, you know, you can't excuse away. They're, they're a problem in and of themselves. But would you agree with me, though, that, that when somebody makes a, a, a statement like, well, liberal values are superior, that that actually is true. It's just that you have to be liberal across the board. You can't fall into the tribalism trap that you're describing, which is that, you believe liberal values are so superior that you're willing to use illiberal values to try to enforce liberal values on other people because then you're 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 a bad person. So just that's a great point, and just let me, let me make two broad points about that. So one is, I mean, obviously, in order to talk about that, you have to ask what liberal values are, right? right. So whenever somebody says to me, um, "How can you defend Iran when they're throwing?" gaze off roofs, you know, the, then the question becomes, well, how can you defend the U.S., which invaded Iraq, a country of 26 million people, and destroyed it in an aggressive war, or which set up a worldwide torture regime or put people in prison where they still are for over a decade without charges that supported tyrannies all over the world. Um, and so I think that, you know, I don't think, I, I think that, you know, there is no faction that has a monopoly or even close to a monopoly on liberal values. Oh, of course. Um, and, 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 you know, I think that oftentimes the, the factions that most like to embrace liberal values rhetorically are the ones that least embrace it in actions. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is I think context is so crucial, right? So let me just tell you what I mean by this. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, like new atheists will say to me, you know, like, we'll say, oh, you're an apologist for Islam and, and you, you want Sharia law. I mean, you know, I'm a gay secular man <laughs> in a same sex marriage um, who has lived in New York and Washington and Rio de Janeiro my entire life. Um, I am not a person interested in um, 
advocating for the imposition of Sharia law, and I don't want to live under Sharia law, and anyone who suggests anything like that is engaged in idiotic demagoguery, right? Yeah, yeah I agree 100%. So, okay. So, but, so then the question becomes like, well, why don't I spend more of my time and effort and energy denouncing Sharia law? And this is really the nub of the issue for you're me is- You're responsible for the crimes of the U.S. because you well, were it, right, it, right, right. Yeah. Well, there's that, and, and that's gotten a lot of attention. But like, it's even beyond that. Like, if I were, like, if I were a citizen of, let's say, Egypt or Lebanon um, or Saudi Arabia or Tunisia, and I was a columnist or a public intellectual or some kind of like political activist, if I were to denounce the harms of radical Islam, that would have a really important and beneficial effect because there's a debate in those countries where I'm participating in and being listened to over the extent to which Islam should dominate politically, over the kinds of freedoms that people should have within Islam. I would be well positioned to participate in a reformation of Islam. That would be the impact of my devoting myself to those views. If I'm a citizen of the United States who's not a Muslim, I'm not going to lead a fucking reformation of Islam because I'm not in the position to do that. That's not my platform. That's not my ability. If in that context, as an American who, you know, has a column who or, or has a platform and the people listening to me are people who already don't want to live under Sharia law or Islamic radicalism, if I devote myself to that same thing, namely railing against the evils of Islam, the impact that I'm having as an American in an American context is much different then if I'm doing that in Lebanon or Tunisia or Saudi Arabia, the impact I'm going to have is to feed my own government's actions over the last 15 years based on the view that the supreme threat is not imperialism or violence by nation states or any of those sorts of things, but instead is Islam. Um, and so I do think we have a moral and ethical obligation as public intellectuals, as writers, as citizens, not only to think about what ideas do we believe in, but to think about the impact of devoting ourselves to those ideas. And the, that impact changes dramatically based upon the context in which we're doing it. Right. So I, I, what you're laying out there, I often refer to it as the Chomsky rule, that you're, you're responsible for your government's actions, you pay taxes to your government, and of course you should focus on your crimes uh, first. So I totally agree with that. I do think, though, that um, generally speaking, I don't limit myself as a matter of principle to only uh, critiquing the U.S. government. So in other words, you know, there, there will be stories on my show where I critique uh, things happening that other governments are doing or just people in other nations, at, you know, whatever they're doing that I might think is wrong. I'll, I'll devote time right, to that right, as well. Right. And no, nobody would have, like, you know, Chomsky, I don't think anybody thinks no, that No, Chomsky doesn't do that. Yeah, right. No. Right. But, but let me ask you this. Like, so, yeah, okay, yeah, you're an American. Mm -hmm. I assume most of the people who listen to your, you know, your podcast are either Americans or other Westerners. Um, they're obviously people who speak English and you're, you're broadcasting in English. Um, where do you think you're likely to have the most impact, right? If you, are, if, are you going to have the most impact if you discuss police corruption in Chile or, you know, um, extremism in Morocco? Um, or imperialism and inequality in the United States. My view is that you're going to have the most impact on the latter, and therefore, ethically, that's where your greatest attention ought to be. It's not no, that, um, you know, not that you should never talk about the other things because we're human beings in a, in a global world, but that that's where your focus ought to be. No, a hundred percent. And in fact, if you know, I challenge anybody to look through my uh, my video archive, you'll find one of the main subjects I cover would be U.S. imperialism. You know, we just did a story the other day on, uh, you know, the U.S. blocking the inquiry into Saudi Arabia and the U.S.'s war crimes in Yemen. So, yeah, no, I'm all over this. I agree 100 percent. But I, I, I do also think it's important that, broadly speaking, as long as one, especially for my, somebody like myself, who's an American, as long as I, you know, spend a lot of my time rightly critiquing my own government and their crimes... I do think it's absolutely imperative that I, you know, weigh in wherever I see there are wrong. So, in other words, focus on U.S. empire and talk about how bad that is. But then also, and this is where I think I get into slight disagreements uh, with some people on the progressive side, uh, of course I'm going to oppose, for example, Islamic doctrine. Now, it gets, it gets, 
it gets a little iffy because we don't know, like, you have to look at a case-by-case -case basis and different crimes and say, okay, was this terrorist attack uh, done because of doctrine or was it done because of geopolitical circumstances that pushed somebody into doctrine to then do the terrorist act? So it gets complex, there's no doubt about that. But in terms of, you know, my show and others and... and how I think we should move forward. I think absolutely if you're an American, you should probably spend a bulk of your time on U.S. empire because you're responsible for the crimes of your own government, but you absolutely should stand up against, in my opinion, and I don't know how you feel about this, but all religious doctrine across the board because I think religion is kind of inherently a dangerous thing insofar as you actually believe the text of any holy book because it's, you know, saying I'm going to sacrifice rationality at the altar of some book written thousands of years ago that has some uh, potentially dangerous ideas in there. Right. I mean, I totally agree. I mean, like, I mean, I think all, all forms of fundamentalism and extremism can be dangerous, right? Like you can kind of get on a nihilistic path where you say, you know, we're here by accident. There's no God. Life has no meaning. Um, we're going to be here for like the f tiniest flash of a moment and then disappear for eternity. And therefore, you know, there's zero ethical limits on the things that I think. Um, or you can, you know, be a extremist when it comes to nationalism. My country is the greatest. I think we're, you know, stand for the greatest values and therefore we should impose our vision and domination on the world. And if, you know, if somebody is actually doing what you just described, which is, look, I'm an atheist. I think that religion is a really bad thing. And so I devote myself more or less equally to criticizing all of the religions. Not only am I going to have no problem with that, um, I'm going to probably regard that person as doing a positive thing in the world. Um, but I don't actually think that huge factions of people who have turned this form of atheism into this political doctrine actually do that. Um, you'll almost never hear them, for example, um, railing against Judaism or Jews. It's almost, you know, it's just as much of a taboo in that realm as it is in any other. Um, you hear them railing against Christianity, um, for sure, and some of them do that a lot. Um, but still, the bulk of the attention tends to be reserved for, for Muslims and Islam. Um, at exactly the same moment, either coincidentally or deliberately, our foreign policy is predicated on and fueled by a demonization of that very same group. And I think that's where the difficulty starts to arise. And, you know, I mean, a lot of this, like, you know, um, has does have to do with with like just my own background and my own experiences i mean i represented neo-nazis for almost a decade as a first amendment lawyer and represented their free speech rights um, which were under a pretty system systemic attack in a way that would have set really bad precedent so i know a lot of their tactics and before i ever encountered new atheists and these people who are kind of obsessed with the quran and islam despite not having studied it i watched how Neo-Nazis talked about Jews, which was, you know, their kind of bete noir. And the, the, the thing, on, you know, they looked at Jews exactly like some, you know, kind of like anti-Muslim obsessives look at Islam. And one of the tactics that they would use is they would go into the Talmud, um, and it's Talmudic law, and they would pick out actual passages. You know, they didn't fabricate them. They didn't make them up. They are actual passages, and they would kind of tear them out of their context and tear them out of their teaching and tear them out of their tradition and the way they're interpreted and use them to depict Jews as these kind of like completely unethical savages. You know, there's parts of the Talmud that talk about how you can do things to Gentiles that you can't do to Jews, how Gentiles can be slaves of Jews, how you can lie to a Gentile but have an obligation of truth to a Jew. Now, obviously, the reason why this is so wretched and obnoxious and 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 deceitful is because if you know Jews, you know that the vast majority of their, the, the people who are Jews, and by Jews I mean even people who adhere to Judaism, don't interpret and understand the Talmud that way and don't live their lives in accordance with those, those kinds of dictates. Um, it's just a way of demonizing Jews by manipulatively and anti-intellectually tearing passages out of the Talmud. And I think a lot of that is done you know, in terms of Islam and, and the Quran, I mean, every single day I literally get confronted by people who say, why do you defend Muslims? They would throw you off the roof for being gay. And, you know, I'm always mystified by that because I think people who say that actually don't know any Muslims. Um, there are extremists in, in Islam and in Judaism and in Christianity, but the vast majority 
aren't. And so, you know, I just think it's a very kind of anti-intellectual exercise. And it's one that tends to be applied exclusively to, to Islam and not across the board in this equal opportunity, anti-religion sort of way. So when you look at a place like Iran or when you look at uh, the Palestinian territories, I, I submit and I, I think you'll agree that the, the increase in radicalization, if you want to call it that, is directly tied to... Um, in intervention in a geopolitical circumstance, whether we're talking about the 1953 coup of the government in Iran, which and implementing the Shah, which basically pushed people into the arms of fundamentalists, and we can go down the list here. So I do think that it's fair to say a, a, a good chunk of um, terrorism, specifically in the Islamic world, is we do bear a significant burden for that. But at the same time, I think it's really important to also note that. Uh, just like in every other religious ideology, there absolutely are examples of just basically pure ideological terrorism. So just to give one example here, if, if you look at uh, the, the history of Wahhabism, Wahhabism predates any, you know, U.S. imperialism. And the, the ultra-conservative interpretation of uh, Islam is, you know, a far right thing that existed without our, you know, interference in it. Now, I would agree that our actions have basically made that more popular, and I think that's empirically proven. Uh, but I think what a lot of people who might disagree with you, Glenn, are, are curious to hear your thoughts on is whether or not you would agree with me that it's basically a spectrum issue, right? And like there are some people that are purely on the side of they became a terrorist because of geopolitical circumstances and poverty and they're pissed off for some terrestrial grievance <coughs> but then there's plenty of people on the other end of the spectrum too where you know you're raised in a in a in a fundamentalist household that teaches you and basically brainwashes you to believe that these other groups are evil um because they're evil and because our our text says so and then you know we can you can it's justified to do attacks against them based on that would you agree that it's a spectrum and would you agree that people are all across the spectrum depending on each individual case so first of all i don't think anybody disputes that there are a certain number of people who engage in violence who are muslims who are driven if not entirely certainly primarily by religious grievances or religious beliefs. And you can tell that that's the case because of the targets they select. Obviously, someone who shoots in the head a schoolgirl for going to school um, or who kills someone who's an apostate in their own society um, or any of a number of other um, acts of violence that we've seen aimed at people who are perceived to have been violating laws of Islam those acts are overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, religious in nature and not geopolitical. And there's lots of examples of that. Um, at the same time, the, there are huge numbers of examples, and I would say the vast majority of the ones that end up being aimed at the West um, and the ones, therefore, that we pay most attention to, where the people who do them say specifically that they're doing them for things that we recognize as rational geopolitical reasons, which doesn't mean they're justified, just that there's a cause and effect that you can trace. Um, so the examples that you gave of people in Iran chanting death to America and not, you know, death to Argentina or death to Korea, um, but death to the country that overthrew their democratically elected government and imposed on them for decades a hideously brutal dictator, um, or people in Gaza who have been occupied um, for the last 50 years, all you have to do is look at what the United States government, what the United States as a country did in response to one single day of violence brought to our shores, 15 years of violence brought back, um, to see how human beings, regardless of any religious um, ideology or conviction, react when foreign um, elements bring violence and occupation into the places where they live. I mean, it's something that we all ought to expect. And, you know, there are Pentagon studies commissioned by Donald Rumsfeld that answer that question. I mean, in 2003, he asked the Rand Corporation to commission a study, and the question that you asked me is the exact one that he wanted to know the answer of, which is, to, to, which is, is the majority of violence against us and the majority of hatred toward us in the Muslim world driven primarily by religious conviction and ideology, meaning they hate us for our freedoms or they hate us because we're, we're non-Muslims, um, or is it because of geopolitical reasons? And this study in 2004, um, which you can go and read online, said that overwhelmingly they don't hate us for our freedoms, they hate us for our policies, namely occupation, um, the support for the dictators who rule their lives with weapons and money, 
um, support for Israel and, and those sorts of things. And so, you know, the idea that there's anybody denying that sometimes Muslims engage in violence because of their religion is a total straw man. Of course some Muslims do, just like some Christians shoot um, abortion doctors because of religion, and some Jews occupy the West Bank and Gaza because they think, along with evangelical Christians, that God told them that that's greater Israel and have the right religious state to the land. But overwhelmingly, the kinds of violence that in the West we tend to focus on because it's directed at us um, is violence that has a direct causal link to geopolitical perspectives um, that uh, are totally rational and universal. And, you know, I always find it really weird. Whenever you point that out, people say, oh, you're denying the agency of Muslims. You're, no, you're an apologist, they say. That's what they'll say. Yeah, or they say, like, you're denying their agency. And it's exactly the opposite. What you're actually saying is, you know, no, it's pure agency on their part. They're looking at, as they will tell you themselves, drones being brought over to their to their lands and killing their children or armies invading their lands, or money and, and protection going to Israel, um, or tyrants being propped up by the West. And they're saying, I have no other option to stop this besides bringing violence back to the people who are doing it. It's a rational act of agency um, that isn't justified or justifiable, but it is causal and rational geopolitically. And, and yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, so, and that's, you know, you... you, you touched on something there that was one of my key defenses, I guess you could say, of the progressive side of this debate. If, you know, in the ceasefire video, you'll see me go on about this, but when people call progressives regressives or Islamist apologists, I do think that's an out-and-out -out smear, because obviously you've been pretty consistent standing up in favor of gay rights, you know, standing up in favor of women's rights and and you go down the free line in a free speech and free press right. so civil liberty protection so when you try to explain that certain certain kinds of terrorism directed against the u.s there's an explanation for it people immediately oh well, you're apologizing for it but like you just said a hundred times you're, you're a hundred percent against it you're just trying to explain where you think it comes from it's like you know it for example the black crime rate in america if, if we bring up Hey, there. You know that's birthed out of a history of oppression and racism and systemic issues. If somebody calls you an apologist when you say that, as if you're in favor of crime, it's just such an obvious sidestep of the point you're trying to make, and you're doomed to to continue, you know, having the same problem if you don't look at the roots of it to try to address it and do your part to make it better. Or just to, 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 in order to understand it so you can speak about it intelligently, right? So, you know, I always find it bizarre, this whole idea of if you look at causation, that it means you're engaged in justification or apology, especially from people who think that they think about the world rationally or even scientifically, which is nothing but a search for causal connections. So, you know, if people are dying of lung cancer, you want to find out why they're developing lung cancer. And if you discover that one of the reasons they're dying of lung cancer is because they're smoking lots of cigarettes um, and you tell them that the people who are smoking lots of cigarettes look the reason that you're getting lung cancer is because you're smoking lots of cigarettes that's not a justification it's not telling them you deserve lung cancer or you brought it on yourself it's a way of telling the world that in order to prevent further incidents of lung cancer we can reduce our levels of smoking um, and if nothing else just as curious people, human beings with the rational capacity about the world. We want to understand causation. Um, and so I do want to understand, as an American, why if you take a poll of the world and ask the world which is the most dangerous threat to world peace, world peace overwhelmingly people say the United States. And that's a fact. Well, Just so every, if anybody out there is getting angry and they're like, I can't believe you said it. No, 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 no. You're talking about... Well-respected polling agencies that have asked people all around the world, and that's what the response is. Now, we could either dismiss everybody ever as a kook, or we can say, well, let's look into exactly why this is. Right. Or, you know, it's like, I, you know, I live in Brazil. I've lived in Brazil for a decade. Um, in the decade that I've lived in Brazil, no Muslim has engaged in a terrorist attack against Brazil. Um, even though it's a really huge, open country, it has 280 million people, it's roughly the same physical size as the United States, slightly smaller but comparable. Um, so as an American, I want to know why that is. Like, why, um, why is it that, that Muslims in the Middle East or in Pakistan 
um, or elsewhere um, have this hatred toward the United States and a desire to bring violence to the United States and Americans, but not toward Korea or, um, you know, Brazil or Chile or a variety of other countries. I want to understand the reasons for that because Brazilians are not Muslim any more than Americans are. In fact, Americans tend to be, there's a bigger Muslim population in the United States than there is in Brazil. Um, and so I think it's really important to understand that. It's also important to understand that when it comes to endorsing the policies of your government to understand what the consequences of those policies are going to be. Right. right. And so here's another uh, aspect to this that I think is pretty important. Um, there are some people who are new atheists who they tend to just uh, believe in the idea that there should be some government that attempts to be altruistic, attempts to be humanitarian, attempts to be the world policeman, and they actually stand for, you know, protecting people, doing the right thing, standing up for freedom, so on and so forth. And I think that um, history is pretty clear on that, that any time you have one government try to take a leadership role and to do those things, the, the concern for altruism or humanitarianism or doing the right thing largely becomes a cover for selfish motives because humans are only human and who knows human nature might be such that that's that's always what it morphs into and i think the key point here is you imperialist violence violence for geopolitical power violence for natural resources this stuff is also kind of in and of itself a fundamentalist religion. I often refer to American exceptionalism and neoconservatism as a fundamentalist religion. So I think you're right when you say you can't always point your finger at the other and talk about how bad the other is because it feeds this narrative of, well, then, I mean, we're the good guy, and even when we do bad things, well, we didn't mean it, so therefore, you know, look past it. But that's kind of the argument. Like, every imperialist power ever had reasons and rationalizations where they could say, no, here is why we're good, and here is why when we fuck up, it's okay. But that was never convincing to people back then for every other imperialist power. So why should anybody be convinced by ours today? And like we were alluding to before, they're not, if you look at the polling data. And I think it's important for Americans to break free from that bubble. But with that being said, yeah. I, I do think it makes sense to, at the same time that you vehemently oppose empire and vehemently oppose the wrongdoings of your own nation, absolutely I would continue to point out fundamentalist Islamic problems. And, I mean, let's face it, there are a lot of people living and under, like Saudi Arabia, for example. And Jewish problems and fundamentalist Christian problems and fundamentalist nationalistic problems. Right. But like, um, so you know, that's, that's, I mean, I think if you're going to take that position um, and it ends up getting applied only to one form of extremism, that's when I think the motives or at least the impact becomes questionable to objectionable. If it really is the sort of generalized, just I'm going to apply my standards consistently to everybody, I don't think anybody finds that objectionable. Right. But OK, so then just one more thing on this, then we can move on. But um, this is where I think you and I might ha actually have a disagreement here is I, I know from doing my show, Glenn, that. Like, there are a lot of people out there, myself included. Like, I read Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. I read Sam Harris' Letter to a Christian Nation. I read a lot of these different New Atheist books. And I read them basically at the same time that I was reading Noam Chomsky, who I also absolutely love. And I think there are a lot of people, and it, it's, it, do, it doesn't come across like this online because they're largely silent because they mostly agree with you. But I think there are a lot of people online who like all those guys and so in other words point is they're essentially new atheists and they're progressives and when i say they're new atheists they're new atheists in the sense that they might be just against the idea of religious doctrine in principle and they see a problem with it so they stand up and they argue against it but while they do that it's at the same time that they hold the idea that american imperialism is a huge problem uh... and you know this is something that also needs to be opposed D do you can you see how that's possible that perhaps, you know, the new atheist crowd that you're exposed to where they basically yell at you nonstop and make ridiculous arguments, that that's not representative of the entire new atheist crowd? Yeah, I, and I, I think it's, I'm glad you mentioned that, and, and it's something that's easy to forget because online acrimony tends to be extremely 
um, faction driven where you just pick your side and that's your side. And, and there's just then a war that, that doesn't acknowledge any of the nuance, which is why I found the video that you did actually interesting, as I said at the beginning. Um, and I think it is an important po point because I do have people saying to me, not all that infrequently, you know, I don't understand why you fight with people like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. I'm a huge fan of theirs, but I'm also a huge fan of yours. And for a long time, I was thinking, how can that possibly be? How can that possibly be that you think they're doing great things and I'm doing great things when what we're doing is so fundamentally at odds? I think that what they're doing is contributing to an agenda that is more or less the agenda to which I've devoted myself to opposing. Um, but the more I think about it, the more I do understand it, which is, you know, look, I mean, I remember, you know, 20 years ago, I grew up as, as a gay man in, in the 1980s. You know, I came of age when, you know, the predominant political movement at the time was the moral majority. Um, you know, people forget in 1988, Pat Robertson, one of the most, you know, malicious Christian extremist in the country came in second place in the Iowa caucus when he ran for president. Um, you know, and Jerry Falwell was regularly meeting with Ronald Reagan and they were calling themselves the moral majority and being treated this way. And so for me, left wing politics and a defense of progressive values was very much about opposing religion and opposing um, organized religion in particular. And so, of course, I understand why somebody who is on the left, who is an anti-imperialist and who um, thinks that the U.S. is doing really awful things in the world and that Israel is as well, simultaneously finds it appealing to listen to public intellectuals in a seemingly smart and rational and aggressive and unapologetic way rail against the organized religions that have been oppressive to them for so long. And, and that does include Islam along with Christianity and Judaism, all of which stem from similar um, origins and have a lot of views in common, um, especially as they manifest politically. Um, so it is one of the ironies that these two factions that are at each other's throats so viciously um, in fact, you know, do have people who have one foot in one and one foot in the other. Um, and that gets back to what I was saying before, which is I think part of why it's become so, um, you know, sort of such a destructive discourse is because it takes place on Twitter. And I do think that Sam Harris is a uniquely kind of inflammatory figure um, for a whole variety of different reasons in a way that, say, like Richard Dawkins or even Christopher Hitchens um, – aren't and, and, and weren't. Um, That's interesting, because I disagree I with Hitchens, I think, more than anybody. He was way, big time in favor of the Iraq War. No, no, right. I, right. But by that, what, what I'm really talking about kind of like personal characteristics in terms of how people engage in advocacy. Um, I've never encountered in my entire life a public figure who immediately brands any of their critics as being not just wrong, but bad faith liars. Right, yeah. like it's almost impossible to criticize Sam Harris without him instantly claiming that not just that you're wrong or mistaken, but that you're viciously smearing and lying about what it is he's saying in a way that, say, Christopher Hitchens never did or that Richard Dawkins doesn't do. Um, well, Hitchens, because he was drunk or else he would have done it. <laughs> right. And so I, just, I think there's something very kind of unique. I think there's something unique, too, about his views on Israel. Um, and U.S. foreign policy that isn't quite representative of his new atheist followers. Right. Um, I think he's a very political actor and so un is aware of those differences and sort of downplays them while at the same time trying to inculcate them. So I do think a lot of this is specific to him. Um, I think a lot of it is about the fact that it takes place on Twitter. You can see the discussion that we're having which I think is more constructive. I think a lot of the debate that takes place in writing is a lot more constructive, right. um, certainly than it is on Twitter. So, um, yeah, I think those commonalities just get papered over for those reasons. So what do you, what do you make of his uh, – I, I know, I, I mean, I, we didn't really need to get into this, but I feel like we should bring it up now. The, um, like, the different policy things that people on the left have opposed Sam Harris for, like, I tend to agree with the original criticisms from the left of him with his, the stuff he said on profiling and torture and all stuff like that. But he was an opponent of the mosque at, you know, uh, the, the, the ground, the ground zero mosque. And that's, yeah, that's inexcusable. We have freedom of religion. It's not, that's not debatable. So, you know, um, but like, what do you make of the, 
I feel like his follow-ups were a lot more rational, though, than people give him credit for. Like, when he seemingly was in favor of profiling, and everybody's like, hey, man, what the fuck are you doing? And then he's like, wait, actually, let me explain further. And he goes on to say, well, actually, all I mean is you shouldn't, you know, search grandmas or children at the same rate you should search middle-aged men, basically. So do you, what do you make of his, his is it, is caveats it, or hedges? Because I yeah, think they make his arguments a lot less bad. I think. And when I talk about some of the unique attributes of Sam Harris and the way he argues and the reasons why I think it's extra inflammatory, this is the kind of thing I mean. So, you know, you, like, there are people in our public discourse who see their role as being provocative and who are deliberately controversial. And I regard people who do that as being really important, uh, performing a really important role. And if you're somebody who wants to purposely kind of like poke at orthodoxies and say things that you're not supposed to say because you think that it needs more debate or because you believe it, then, you know, you have to be aware of what it is that you're doing. Like, I think that that's something that Richard Dawkins does really well. Like, he purposely goes out and pisses a huge number of people off. <laughs> and then when he does it, he's unapologetic about it. Um, you know, sometimes he claims he's been misinterpreted. We all are misinterpreted sometimes or deliberately distorted. But by and large, he says, yep, I said that. I don't care that you're angry about it because I'm going to stand by it. I know that a lot of the things that I say, a lot of the views that I advocate are also going to provoke and offend and anger a lot of people. And so I'm prepared for that. I understand what the reaction is going to be. Um, and then I'm willing to engage in that debate. I think the thing that Sam Harris does that is an act of – um, serious kind of intellectual cowardice um, is that he purposely says things in a way to be the most provocative possible. So he'll say something, you know, he'll write under the headline in defense of torture. Um, or he will, um, you know, say things like certain beliefs are so whatever it was, you know, evil or extreme that it's actually ethical to kill people for them. He's not stupid. He understands exactly what he's saying and how people are going to react. And when people react in the way that he intends, which is to get provoked and to get offended and to get um, angry, instead of saying, no, your offense and your anger doesn't change the fact that this is correct, um, he'll say, you've lied about my position, and that is not what I think. This is instead what I think. And you're right, the things that he then says that he actually thinks, rather than the things that he said in the beginning – are more it's more reasonable because by that point he's in the mode where he's trying to say that he's been victimized by slanderers and liars who have lied about his position. And I'll just give you the, the what I think is the best possible example that illustrates what I mean. He did write that passage that says, I think that certain views are, and I don't want to, it's a paraphrase, but I think certain beliefs are so threatening or menacing or whatever that you can actually kill people for them. And Reza Aslan retweeted somebody who had put a picture of him next to that sentence, and I did the same thing. And he wrote this long thing saying, this is the mechanics of slander, and it, you know, that's not what I meant. And he, he, he described what he meant in a much more sort of nuanced way, and he said, all I really meant was that certain people like al-Baghdadi, whose beliefs lead them to do things like head a terrorist organization and try and kill people, those people can be ethically killed. And Robert Wright, the longtime Atlantic writer, wrote a piece that I urge everybody to go read if you have any interest in any of this, in which he said, this is perfectly encapsulates Sam Harris. Because it's one of two things. Either Sam Harris simply meant that people like al-Baghdadi have certain beliefs that manifest in actions, like trying to kill innocent people, that justifies you killing them. In which case, it's a totally anodyne and banal and uncontroversial statement but he didn't actually mean you can kill people for their beliefs. He meant you can kill people for their actions. Um, but he just sort of said it in a like sort of um, poorly chosen way. Right. And that all he really meant was something that everybody would agree with, which is that you can engage in actions in which, which justify you killing people because it's violent and aimed at innocent people and it's terrorism. Or what he meant is actually what he said, which is that just the mere belief that you have in your head, independent of actions that you can you might take, just the, the ideology that you have or the beliefs that you have justifies um, a nation state or somebody else killing you in advance. And the way he originally wrote it was number two, which of course is extremely controversial. And then when he wanted to accuse everybody of being a liar for pointing it out, he moved to number one, which was this extremely reasonable, all I meant was, you know, you can kill people for their actions. And I think that's 
his tactic in general and the reason why he's such a lightning rod for so much of the vitriol. Yeah, and on, on the issue of torture, too, in follow-ups, he said, no, I think it should be illegal across the board, which then makes everybody go, okay, then why are we debating? But it's because the original, in the original article, if you read his... the defense of torture and said, I'm one right. of the few people brave enough to say that in certain cases, torture is ethically not only justifiable, but necessary. Right, which and is so why... Exactly what he's doing, which is making it seem as though he's a brave intellectual because he's willing to stand up alone in the world and make the pro-torture case. And then when you point out that he's doing that, he says, how dare you lie about my position? All I meant was that actually it should always be illegal. Right. Now, whatever else is true, as a writer, if you're constantly being misunderstood by people who don't have a history in any other context of lying – um, maybe it's time to start evaluating what it is you're doing as a public intellectual that's causing so many people to either misunderstand what you're saying or, or distorting it. And he doesn't ever seem to engage in that kind of reflection. He's willing to instead of just assume that everyone who's a critic um, is just really ethically wretched and, and purposely lying about what it is that he's saying. And um, that makes it really hard to have discussions with people. In his in his interview, with, I don't know if you saw it, but his interview with Jank uh, from TYT, he yeah. um, like that that was a good conversation. Number one, but number two, you know, he came across just fine. Like he didn't say anything at all that I thought was inflammatory or went too far. And then when you couple that with the fact that his concern about religious doctrine is one I agree with, I don't think he's like some uh, some kind of super unreasonable dude. But I think you're right that he. There are instances where, like his original article on torture, his original article on profiling, anybody can read that and go, whoa, 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 whoa. And the same thing with like, the nuclear uh, first strike thing. In right. all of his clarifications, he always says, to, basically to his credit, that no, I'm, actually what I'm really talking about here is just a case of imminent self-defense. But then the problem is, again, when you read the original wording, it's like, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't like that. Like, you just get the feeling of, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% with that. But I, I don't, again, I don't think he's, I, I honestly believe his, his beliefs are more all in the clarifications of what he said more than the original thing, which could be viewed very in, in an inflammatory way. And by the way, I think he would acknowledge, Glenn, that like titles like in defense of torture and titles like in defense of profiling I mean, that's, of course, anybody's going to have a reaction to that who has any kind of basic moral decency of, whoa, man, what's going on here? Right. I mean, I think we all have this, you know, kind of dilemma as writers, um, especially if we're trying to make arguments that not a lot of other people are making or we see our role as provoking debates that aren't happening because, you know, orthodoxies are being embraced kind of uncritically, which is, you know, we often know when we're making an argument, how we might be misunderstood. And so then the question becomes, do you want to kind of defensively say in advance, look, for those who might misunderstand me, I want you to see, want, want you to understand this is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying instead is this. Um, you know, like we, just a good example is like what we were talking about earlier, which is I know that if I make the argument, um, this terrorist that just, you know, attacked the parliament in Ottawa did so in response to Canada bombing Afghanistan for the last, you know, 12 years and being part of this Western alliance that has attacked the Muslim world, I know that a lot of people are going to read that and think he's justifying the terrorism. And so do I then write a paragraph up front or at some point saying, by the way, to talk about causation is not to justify it. I actually don't think it's justified. I'm just describing causation. Or do I say, you know what, I'm not going to preempt people who want to attribute to, 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 to me things that I'm not actually saying. And I used to have that latter approach, you know, fuck these people who might misread what I'm saying. I'm not responsible for holding their hands. Um, and then at some point when you're misunderstood enough, you say, well, what responsibility do I have for the fact that I'm being misunderstood and that maybe I'm not writing with sufficient clarity or I'm not anticipating how my words are likely to be misunderstood and my responsibility as a writer and an advocate is to be as clear as possible and not to trick people into accusing me of things that, although I'm not saying, they have a reasonable ground for think I'm, thinking I'm saying. And I just think the mature, constructive way of being a public advocate um, is to be responsible with your words. Um, and if you think you're being misunderstood by a few numbers of people over and over and over again, it's time to look at yourself and to ask why that is. So in the little time we have left, Glenn, I, re I just I have to ask you some questions about the NSA. I mean, I'd be yeah. I'd be a stupid person if I didn't, you know, It'd talk to Glenn Greenwald about the NSA. Years where we didn't talk about the NSA. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so behind the scenes, this is—I mean, this is what I'm really curious about, man. Because you know, we're both involved in politics and, to some extent, journalism. But you're obviously a real journalist. I'm just a jackass on YouTube. Uh, what was it? What was it like when Ed Snowden came to you? Now, I know at first, as you've said before, like you didn't even necessarily know because you get approached by people all the time, so you didn't know if this was a real thing. But then when you when you learned and when you really figured out, like, oh wow, wait, this is real. What the hell was going on in your head, man? Were you like, this This is historic, this is incredible. Like, what were you thinking? Yeah, you know, I remember the first time I understood the true magnitude of it, which was, you know, on the plane ride from New York to Hong Kong with Laura Poitras, because I made him send me just a few sample documents before I got on the plane to go to Hong Kong, just because I wasn't going to fly halfway around the world until I knew that he was actually real. Um, and so he had sent me, you know, maybe... a I got two dozen documents, which were pretty huge. Um, but, you know, two dozen documents is like two or three stories. One of them was PRISM, so it was a huge story. But still, I thought, okay, this is going to be a really big story. And it wasn't until the plane ride over to Hong Kong when I looked at the full archive and realized the magnitude of what he had done and the ability that this offered to shine genuinely unprecedented light into this extraordinarily consequential yet extremely opaque institution – did I understand the full potential for what this is going to be? And I mean, it's every single emotion that you can possibly imagine. I mean, a huge part of it was genuine just excitement. I mean, it was like the fucking jackpot. You know, I mean, I had been writing about surveillance in the national security state for so many years. And the hardest part is that it's all secret. And then suddenly you have their most sensitive documents, you know, and they're in your hands, which means you get to write about them and show them to the world. And it's just a matter of figuring out the best and most effective way to do that. Um, a lot of it was just kind of, um, you know, tension and anxiety and fear over what someone might do to stop this from happening, um, what they might do if you actually go through with it and start taking these really secretive documents of the world's most powerful government and just publishing them on the Internet. Um, and then there was also just the, all of the strategic questions of knowing that we were about to navigate this extremely intricate, complicated, um, you know, sort of minefield without any playbook. Um, and I knew there were going to be just extreme challenges of all different kinds that I hadn't really experienced before that just made me understand that I had to just devote my full brain power to the questions in front of me and not get carried away with those kind of other, you know, emotional uh, impacts. Now, the, the response from the establishment media, basically, I mean, I think to some extent you were probably expecting them to do exactly what they did, but do you think the people that are on our side of this, basically, that we've effectively counter-argued in the sense that we've kind of tried to let people know that... The Fourth Amendment isn't debatable. That's the whole point. It's almost amazing. If you go back and you read the text of the Fourth Amendment, it's almost like prophetic in that it was specifically made so that Glenn Greenwald and Edward Snowden could be responsible for releasing this information. Yeah. Like, the way it's worded is perfectly clear. I mean, this is clearly unreasonable searches and seizures. So were you re surprised by the response from the establishment media? D did you think they were going to be, you know, up the ass of the government and defending authority no matter what? Or how exactly in your mind did that play out? Yeah, I mean, you know, that was a little bit complicated as well, just because, um, for one thing, my place in the media ecosystem um, was a bit ambiguous, right? I mean, I'm not Bob Woodward. Like, I haven't written for the Washington Post for 30 years. Um, I don't work for the New York Times. I didn't go to journalism school. Um, I haven't been, you know, hanging out on Meet the Press for the last, you know, 20 years. Um, Which is why you did this, by the way. If you were hanging out on Meet the Press all that time, they would have chipped away at your ethical code. Right. I mean, more and more, you know, impressively, I mean, it's why Snowden purposely sought out people who weren't in that circle, because his big worry was that, he was going to sacrifice his life to give a journalist all of this information and they would publish maybe one or two stories uh, with it and then just sort of give it all back to the government, which is almost certainly what would have happened. I mean, the, the people who broke into the FBI in 1971 to uncover COINTELPRO um, sent their materials to a bunch of different newspapers um, and they were lucky that someone finally published it. A lot of those newspapers actually took it and called the FBI and alerted the FBI to the fact that they 
someone had this information and never published it at all. And of course, there's been lots of recent examples where journalists did that as well. Um, so, you know, I don't want to overstate it because there were, we did actually ultimately get a lot of support um, from journalists. Um, when David Gregory, you know, asked me about <laughs> prosecuted, I would say most journalists were on my side. Right. Um, you know, Andrew Ross Sorkin was forced to apologize immediately by the reaction of his peers. We did end up winning the Pulitzer and pretty much every journalism award around the world. But, you know, definitely when I watched a lot of the raw footage that Laura Poitras took of myself and her and Snowden in Hong Kong, it was really interesting that we had spent at least as much time, probably more time, talking about journalism than we did about surveillance, knowing that one of the biggest challenges we were going to face was that the American media was going to be largely hostile to what it was we were doing once they understood the magnitude because their primary sympathies lie with the U.S. government over which they absurdly claim to exercise watchdog adversarial authority. So, yeah, we definitely regarded the establishment media as one of our principal adversaries, as one of our principal challenges to overcome, and I think that turned out to be true. Glenn, let me ask you a, a silly question here. Wouldn't Edward Snowden win a case? Like, if he were to come back and they were to charge him, I mean, the whole idea of, like, secret information, classified information, top secret information, like... The government can't just declare anything that is embarrassing and exposes stuff about them, you know, top secret. Like, oh, we don't like this, so therefore it's, it's, it's classified. And wouldn't Edward Snowden, if he were to come back here and be brought up on trial, wouldn't he win? And doesn't he have a very, very strong Fourth Amendment no. case to make? No, he would almost definitely lose because what you just said, although it should be true and although one would think it was true, is actually completely not true. Under really? the Espionage Act, of 1917, think about that, first of all, that he would be tried like all whistleblowers over the last several decades have been tried under a statute enacted by Woodrow Wilson intended to criminalize dissent over the U.S. participation in World War I. It was essentially designed, to, it's, it's the Espionage Act of 19-fucking-17. So you're talking about uh, you know a hundred year statute enacted at the time of the First World War um, and under that law and under subsequent amendments to it and the court uh, cases that have interpreted it, if you are charged with violating it, the way that you violate the Espionage Act is if you take information that the government has declared secret and you give it to someone that's not authorized to receive it. That is a violation of the Espionage Act. If you want to go into court and make a defense along the lines of this information never should have been secret in the first place or the public good was advanced by its disclosure, the court will bar you even from raising that as a defense. Those are not recognized defenses to the Espionage Act. If you have taken classified information, meaning information the government has deemed classified and have given it to, transmitted it to someone not authorized to receive it, and you did it on purpose, um, you are guilty of felonies under the Espionage Act, regardless of your motives and regardless of whether it should have ever been a secret in the first place. And that's why all these people who go on these news shows and say, Edward Snowden, if he thinks he did the right thing, uh, should man up and come back to the U.S. and argue before a jury of his peers that he did the right thing are just utterly lying or they're ignorant because wow. under that law, that would not be a defense. And other whistleblowers have been barred from raising that as a defense, which is why it's almost impossible to win those cases. So it's almost like, you know, what you've just laid out there is a pretty solid argument that the the Constitution, at least on this front, is just wholly irrelevant. Like, they don't care about what it says. Cause, and the whole idea is supposed to be that, you know, if you if you pass a law, but the law is unconstitutional, well, then that, you know, that that's not really valid. But what you're describing there is the government. For so long, we've had this precedent of this law, which is basically unconstitutional, but the, whatever court would uphold the law basically over the Constitution. Is that right? I mean, yes. I mean, the essence of this law is that if the government tells you that you're not allowed to talk about certain information, that is the end of the inquiry. It means oh. it is a criminal offense to talk about it, which you're right. I mean, is really wildly inconsistent with, if not a direct violation of the First Amendment. The other thing that I think is really worth noting is that, you know, federal judges like the, like the media were supposed to be checks on abuses of executive power. It's supposed to be the separate branch that is there to say, you cross the line. You, the federal government, have crossed the line. And the lines are defined by the Constitution or by other statutes that Congress enacts. Unfortunately, in the post-9-11 era, federal judges have been just as subsumed by 
kind of national security hysteria as anybody else. In fact, probably even more so for a variety of complicated reasons. Um, and if I had to identify the institution that has most disgracefully abdicated its responsibility in the post 9-11 era, it wouldn't be the American media or the Congress, although those are obviously really good candidates. It would be the federal judiciary. If, if someone is accused of harming national security or uh, endangering national secrets, especially if they're Muslim, but even if they're not, um, judges just absolutely cheat. They rule in favor of the government in almost every case, and conviction is almost guaranteed. I mean, the last thing you would be comfortable doing if you were Edward Snowden is coming back charged with multiple felonies that could send you to prison for the rest of your life um, for violating or damaging national security and putting your, 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 your welfare in the hands of the federal judiciary. That's the last thing you would want to do. Getting a fair trial is almost the opposite of what would happen. I hate to be so strident on this point, man, but I mean, what, what you're really describing here, it sounds a, a lot like just pure authoritarianism, where you have a guy who's a whistleblower who's clearly bringing forward information that the American people should know that people are being spied on, all their metadata is being collected, you don't need a specific warrant for a specific terrorist investigation, and the government is just like, okay, well, you're, you're a criminal, and we'll bring you up on trial if you're here, and you're going to lose, and that just sounds like out-and-out -out authoritarianism. It's, it, no, it's, the reason it's, it's, it's particularly shocking is because it isn't just that what he disclosed prompted a worldwide debate and a domestic debate that was, you know, important and serious that never would have happened had he not done what he did. Nor is it that it triggered actual legislative reforms in Congress, which never would have happened in the absence of what he did, because most members of Congress, as they told me repeatedly, didn't right. even know that any of this was happening. Um, courts, courts have actually found that some of the programs that he exposed are illegal, are violations of the Constitution and of the law. So if you are not able, as a citizen, as an employee of the federal government, to discover illegalities being committed by the government and then expose them so that your fellow citizens know about them without going to prison for 60 years, what else is that besides authoritarianism? It's venerating the authority of the U.S. government over every single other value, including the Constitution and the law. So just we'll end on this question here, very broad question. I know it's a really hard one to answer, and it's actually really complex. But how, how do we win? Like, how, how do we win? How do we get it so that a guy like Edward Snowden can come back and not, you know, face ridiculous charges? How do we make it so that other people in the government... How do we make it so that the government understands from now on, hey, if you're going to say something's classified or top secret or whatever, it better fucking be the nuclear launch codes or the position of our troops on the battlefield during a fucking battle or something. How do we get back to a point where we actually win this thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that political change is typically incremental and imperceptible um, and does come from kind of the percolation of ideas, even though there's no immediate gratification to it. Like if you record a YouTube podcast and, and persuade, you know, 30 people, um, you're not going to see the immediate benefits of it. And then they go and persuade a bunch of people that may not have been persuaded previously. And maybe one of the people that you reach is like an Edward Snowden, um, who then does something really significant that he wouldn't have otherwise done. That is, those things are really important to do. Um, and oftentimes we overlook their value because they don't have immediate or measurable or quantifiable um, outcomes. But that is really crucial. And to me, that's probably like the single most important lesson that I learned from working with Edward Snowden is that, you know, here, like Edward Snowden was this guy who, he didn't graduate high school. He grew up, you know, in this lower middle class environment. His, his father was spent 30 years in the Coast Guard. Um, you know, he just grew up in North Carolina and, and Virginia and Maryland. He was this totally anonymous, obscure employee for this huge you know, corporation and that did a lot of government contracting work, totally ordinary in every single way. Um, and yet he just reached the point where through an act of conscience and courage, you know, he radically changed the world. I mean, he did. He changed how hundreds of millions of people think about all sorts of things all over the world through his actions. And, and I think, you know, a lot of times it's easy to kind of encounter this defeatism and, and we're all susceptible to it. And that part of it is, is kind of deliberately, cultivated like the idea that well look these forces are just so powerful and these beliefs so entrenched that we're just way too insignificant to actually change it um and i think it's really important to always battle against that idea um right 
you know, you like the Rosa Parks notion that the most ordinary person can spawn the most radical change or a Tunisian street vendor who sets himself on fire and sparks the Arab Spring. I think it's always important to have that belief in your own ability as an individual um, to affect political change and to change the world. And usually the dissemination of ideas um, is the most important way to do that. Yeah, if you if you were to tell somebody in Mississippi or Alabama, tell a black person in Mississippi or Alabama in 1959, you know, hey, do you think that uh, segregation will not be the official code of law here in, you know, five years? It, they would have laughed at you and said, it's never going away ever. I mean, it, it was George Wallace who famously said, you know, segregation now, segregation forever or something to that effect, right? So I guess yeah. you're right. We got to keep fighting. And also... Uh, not to open up another can of worms here, but money in politics too. I think once if you if we don't attack the issue of money in politics, then we don't honestly we don't get any serious advancement in on any other front because that's really what blocks us in most areas from getting common sense reform. I mean, just the the gun debate, which is very relevant right now, right? I mean. Uh, over 90% of the American people want a universal background check. 40% of gun purchases don't have a background check. We haven't gotten that done because the gun manufacturers, in essence, pay the politicians and the Republicans on this example end up blocking everything. But the Democrats are just as guilty of it on other issues too, like financial issues, and we could go down a list. So there are some very important you know, fronts we're talking about here. One of the biggest overarching issues would have to be money in politics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and... You know, I think what, you know, one of the, I think it's easy a lot of times to overlook all those systemic issues because we're all taught to think about our political culture in certain ways. Like we live in a democracy and political change happens because we go and vote and the people choose their representatives and those representatives carry out the people's will. Um, and, you know, things, words like authoritarianism, which you used earlier, or oligarchy, which is what you're describing now, um, are really difficult labels to accept for our own culture and our own political system because we're so inculcated to think that only happens elsewhere. Um, but I do tend to agree that, you know, the problems politically are ones that take place on a fundamental level. And I think you're right that until those change fundamentally, um, reforms can be symbolic, they can be designed to placate public anger, but they're not going to be really substantive or serious until those more fundamental shifts take place. Couldn't agree more. Glenn, I, I can't tell you how much fun this was, man. I really appreciate the fact that you came on and, and we spoke here about new atheism and the NSA and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, thanks so much, man. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for the conversation.